morning, everyone. Um, hope everyone's doing well. Your ears are recovering. Try to be soft and gentle this morning. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really great to be here. Um, I, yeah, no problem. Um, don't have a title for my talk, or I didn't have a title for my talk sent in, par partially because things have been busy, but mostly because I wanted to see who was here, who was in the room, and learn from um, the day session yesterday. And I just want to thank everyone for their rich presentations and, and uh, for the discussions that, that occurred. Um, and um, talk a little bit about the work I do. Um, as was mentioned, I work at West Coast Environmental Law, which is a nonprofit legal organization in, uh, based in Vancouver. We work across the country and, um, and talk about a project that we have on the go right now called RELAW, which stands for Revitalizing Indigenous Law for Land, Air, and Water. Uh, long title, but I'll, I'll speak a little bit about what we're up to, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the panelists' um, uh, presentations as well. So these are two photos from Clem 2 on the central coast of British Columbia, um, the traditional territory of the Kitisuhehe First Nation, um, a nation that we work with in the Rila project. Um, this is a photo of their big house, um, and one of the ceremonies um, that they, they host and take, take part in, um, in their big house. So these photos are here to show um, the vibrancy and the aliveness of the Kitisuhehe laws and their practice of governance, um, despite deliberate and systematic attempts by the Canadian state um, to suppress their laws and their governance systems. And one of the more well-known ways that this happened um, in BC was through the potlatch ban, um, which was a law in place to, to make um, the practice of law and the practice of governance um, illegal under state law. But despite that law, um, these practices and these laws are still alive um, today, and these are photos from today, and um, are sort of the heart of the work that that we're doing um, with the Kitisuhehe Nation. So I have to give a shout out um, to Dr. Val Napoleon and Dr. John Burroughs at the Indigenous Law Research Unit at UVic. Um, these are um, my two mentors in this work. Um, they really opened my eyes to the realities in, in Canada today and, and um, the importance of working with Indigenous law um, as a lawyer. We have ep ethical law obligations to hold up the laws of the land. And, um, you know, often that we think of that stops with common law or the civil law, but of course, um, that should extend as well to the Indigenous laws of, of this land. Um, and this is really exciting. They just this year launched um, the world's first indigenous law degree where students at UVic Law School can receive de a degree in um, Canadian common law as well as in indigenous law. It's really exciting, um, groundbreaking work and just wanna give them a shout out here. So here are some photos from um, Kitisuhehe territory. Um, so the Kitisuhehe um, approached uh, West Coast Environmental Law a few years ago um, because they're really concerned about their herring harvest. Um, so herring um, are an important food source for the Kitisuhehe. Um, and you can see um, in that photo with the island, that is a photo from um, Kitisu Bay or Kitisu Lugyex, um, which is what they call their bread basket. This is where they go to harvest herring spawn, um, herring eggs um, for in the spring. So that photo shows the spawn happening. That's why the, 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 the color of the water is milty. Um, and um, that photo up there shows where their territory is and where Kitisu Bay is. So they've been noticing um, a decline in the, um, their harvest of herring. Um, over the years, and they have really sophisticated laws around the herring harvest. They have laws about who can harvest where, um, how, and they notice that you know the Canadian laws 
weren't in line with their way of doing things. Um, so these two photos on the bottom show um, the one on your, I don't know, my right or left, um, shows the way that the Kitisuhehe harvest herring. So what they do is they submerge um, branches into the water that gather the herring eggs um, just naturally as the, as the herring are spawning, and then they pull them up and they harvest the eggs from those branches. So it's relatively um, not intrusive and uh, allows the herring to survive and spawn again another year. Contrast that with this photo on the other side. This is what the ca Canadian law system allows in terms of a herring harvest. Uh, they just scoop up like massive nets of herring that are alive, kill them, cut them open, take the eggs out, and um, use the rest of the adults for um, just like fi fish meal. Actually, they feed it back to fish, so it's kind of messed up. But um, And this is really harmful, no doubt, because you're taking big, um, big populations of herring out of the, out of the system and um, not allowing them to replenish. So this is what Canadian law says is okay. This is, and this is how the Kitisuhehe are, are currently harvesting um, their, their herring spawns. So they came to us and they said, okay, this is, this is a real concern um, and what can we do about it? Meanwhile, they have been actively asserting and enforcing their laws around the herring harvest for since time immemorial. So they have been out on the ground stopping the commercial herring boats coming into their Kitisu Bay um, every year. And it's an exhausting process for them. Um, and it's been successful. So they've been successful in stopping the herring harvest for, for a long time. But they're tired and they want to know what are the legal options um, under Canadian law and how can our laws kind of interact in that realm. So um, we have a project, like I mentioned, called the Rila Project and um, we've been working with the Kids to Hey Hey as part of this. Um, this is an overview of what we do. So um, we start by um, working with the Indigenous nations we're working with. Um, to do a deep dive into understanding what their legal principles are around um, the issues that they bring to the table. So with the Kitisu Hey Hey, it was around fisheries management, and we look to their stories. We've, we've read with them um, over 100 stories, publicly available stories, as well as stories that um, knowledge holders and elders would bring to us at um, T. M. Bannock storytelling sessions that we hosted up in Clem 2, um, to learn about what their laws are saying about uh, fisheries management, governance, and the herring harvest in particular. And um, then we bring what we learn to the community and we do research with um, interviewing as many people as we can um, about what they think um, in terms of what their laws are and as well as like what they want to see happen on the ground. And we come up with what we um, kind of what we refer to as contemporary indigenous law instruments, which is a mouthful, but it's essentially a way of um, sort of reflecting the, um, the Kirisu Hehe or any indigenous nation that we work with, their legal principles um, in a modern way that um, is sort of speaking to the audiences that they want to speak to. So often who they want to speak to are colonial governments, third parties, industry, um, or members of the public, and even often members of their own communities. Um, and then we work with the nations we're working with to implement and enforce these, um, these laws that we draft up with them. So some examples of projects that we've worked on, um, land use plans, watershed plans. Um, we heard from the Statlium Nation yesterday some really interesting examples that they're working on, um, as well as the Taltan. As, um, we, another project, we're working with the Heltzik First Nation in the Central Coast, um, and they are uh, drafting uh, an Oceans Act um, that they call um, respecting and taking care of our ocean relatives. Um, and we're also, we work on sort of treaties or declarations, other written statements of law. And of course, I just want to mention here that um, 
it's, it's a choice to write down these laws in the modern context um, and nations that we work with, we always have the conversation about, you know, what that process looks like and um, the dangers of writing things down um, versus the power that words on page can, can hold. Um, and that's a theme that comes up time and time again and, and always a challenging conversation, um, but a really rich one. So here's an example from Kitisuhehe territory. Um, so they, they had, we, ha we hosted many community meetings to decide what do we want to do um, in Kitisu Bay to, to protect the herring harvest and to uphold their laws. So they decided that they wanted to declare the area as a uh, indigenous protected area under their law. Um, this is still draft, so please don't share. Um, um, and essentially, declare to the state governments, to the commercial um, herring fishers, um, that this is a, uh, an area protected under, under their law where no commercial herring harvest should occur. Um, and then there's the question of enforcement. So Canadian state government has been slow to recognize indigenous laws, like the reality of indigenous laws, and to um, take them seriously on the ground. Um, there, are, there are, of course, exceptions to that. Um, and, but here we talk about the enforcement of, of indigenous laws and you know, all the work that we go into drafting, for example, an indigenous protected area plan or a declaration is only worthwhile um, if it can achieve results on the ground. Um, so when it comes to enf enforcing indigenous laws, um, we need to get creative. And I just want to mention that there's, of course, so many ways of doing this work and that, ha that has been done for millennia. Um, so this is just sort of the modern context um, with the nations that we're working with. Um, so one way is through education. That's why we were making this brochure. It's like, just to let people know that this is what's happening in a, in a I am hoping a nice aesthetic design um, and to let people know whoever comes through Clem2 um, gets one of these brochures so that they know um, that the laws of the land, at least in this area. Um, of course, we heard some other examples yesterday of direct action and the Kirisuhehe have been out there, like I said, for I think upwards of 30 years. Um, on their boats uh, every year, com directly confronting the um, the herring fishers, and um, that is them sort of enforcing their laws on the ground. Um, another another really amazing program that the uh, Kirisuhehe and other nations on the coast have up and running are their coastal guardian watchman networks, where they are. Uh, out patrolling their territories and um, conducting monitoring and, and enforcing their laws um, where possible. And um, this sign here is um, from the Heltzik Nation. So it says, due to lack of respect for Heltzik Gvi laws, you are hereby given a notice of extinction, of extinction, ev ev eviction, <laughs> extinction um, from the Heltzik Nation. So <laughs> um, this is, this is um, a, a sign that was up on the DFO office, um, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans office in um, Bella Bella. And this was also around the herring harvest where um, this was their response to the herring harvest in their territory where they essentially occupied the Department of Fisheries and Oceans office, um, put up this sign um, and uh, as an expression, gui laws is, is the health sick term for um, their laws or their ways of of knowing. So back to the RELAW project. Um, the Kirisuhehe Nation is one of the nations that we're working with, but we've been um, at this project for three years now. Um, so we've done three, we've been working with three um, groups of indigenous nations from BC. Um, this is a map of the nations that we've worked with thus far. Um, and we're in the third year. Um, it just sort of shows the extent of the work and um, uh, the geographic spread. 
Um, we're, we're wanting to work with nations across BC um, in different indigenous legal traditions to um, give a little extra energy to the important work of rev revitalizing their laws um, and uh, spread our resources around. And here is a really awesome seven minute uh, video that I'm not gonna show today, but I encourage you to go check it out online. Um, and um, it just does a good job of explaining the project um, better than I can do, but anyways, it's there. Um, I, I don't have time to talk through this example today, but please come talk to me if you're interested in another example of um, assertion of indigenous laws in fisheries management. Um, this, is a, this is one that has had a positive, positive outcome. You'll see at the bottom, Crab Pilot Project, a positive step towards collaborative fisheries management. So here, the Central Coast Indigenous Nations and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans are now jointly managing the crab fishery, and it's been um, very successful from the perspective of the Indigenous Nations, and they're hoping that they'll be able to, to roll out this pilot for all the other fisheries in their territories. And um, I guess finally, I just want to close by saying um, that this is real on the ground, important work. Um, my, uh, the nations that I work with um, weren't able to come with me here because they're um, too busy, um, but they did ask me to come and learn uh, as much as I can about what's working in other territories um, here in Canada or from other um, other indigenous nations. So um, I just, I guess it's an invitation for people to come um, talk to me afterwards and share um, what's working so that we can, so I can bring back the best uh, research back to my, uh, the nations that I'm working with um, because they couldn't be here and I promised I would. And um, I just think it's a really uh, great thing that we're all in this room together and um, I promised I'd bring back the best best example, so please come talk to me about what's working or what's not working, or if you have any ide ideas for the project that um, you can think of, we recognize it's just one way of doing this work and there's many, many, many others, um, and we're just sort of trying it out and hoping that we'll achieve some successes, but um, yeah, I guess my final plea is come talk to me, because 10 minutes isn't that long, um, and to thank you for your attention and I guess pass it over to Kirsten.